My name is Julie Ann Link, and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome the former 30-year Cleveland Orchestra second bassoonist, Phil Austin. Thank you so much for being here, Phil. My pleasure. Thank you. Make sure to stay tuned for a virtual tour of Phil's bassoon stuff at the end of the interview portion of this video. So Phil, let's dive in and could you please share with us an overview of who you are and what you do as a professional musician? Okay, Julie. Um, well, uh, I'm retired from full-time playing now, but I had a 39-year career, uh, nine years in Detroit and 30 years in Cleveland. And um, so now I'm mostly retired, but if Cleveland ever calls for me to sub, I jump right in and I'll take any any part they throw at me. And sometimes I'll play with a group, small group in Cleveland called the Blue Water Chamber Orchestra. And sometimes I'll sub with Akron or Canton Symphony. And I like to play first in those groups because I, I like to play the melody now for once for a change. You know, I played seconds for so long. Could you share with us about where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in uh, suburban Detroit. We had a very, very good uh, band program uh, in our school, and uh, we did not have a string program, uh, but we have great, great music from elementary school through high school, mm -hmm. and that was called East Detroit High School outside of Detroit. So is that how you got introduced to music and the bassoon? Yeah, well, I started out, you know, in the fourth grade with the song flute, and then the clarinet, and then in junior high, the alto clarinet, and then at the end of junior high, they said they need a bassoon in a high school. Would you like to play it? And I said, well, I don't know what a bassoon is, but I think so. They said, well, you have to take lessons. So I started taking lessons uh, and um, I, I really took to the bassoon. I, I did very well with the bassoon, yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to go into music for a career? No, I mean, not, not until I was senior in high school. Mm. You know, I, I, I was a terrible student, Julie. I, I, <laughs> Starting in the 10th grade, I, I, uh, I, I worked in a tile store and I worked every night after school and all day Saturday. And so I told, I sold flooring tile and I didn't do homework. And I finished high school with, I think a 2.3 uh, grade point average. And so uh, I had a hard time getting to college. When I was a senior in high school, uh, our band went to Cedar Point to open up the amusement park for the spring. And I was the drum major that year. And um, so I was going to meet a French horn player, a girl that I had met from Canton, Ohio the year before. We were going to go on rides together. And when we were changing out of our uniform after we did our parade there uh, and getting into our street clothes, a 17-year-old trumpet player asked if he could borrow my, some ID because he wanted to buy the beer they sold in Ohio, 3.2 alcohol, 3.2% 3 lower alcohol. So I did, I mean, my driver's license had a picture. So I loaned him my, my ID card for the draft. For the draft At that time, the Vietnam War was going on. So I just loaned him my, my uh, draft card, which was a big mistake because he got caught with beer and I tried to save him. And they took me to the Sandusky County Jail. Here, I'm, on a, I'm the drum major of the high school marching band and I spent three hours in the Sandusky County Jail. And the band kids had to take up a collection and three bus loads of kids came to the jail to bail out their drum major. So pretty <laughs> embarrassing story, really. And then later in the year, I was still a senior at the high school and uh, Wayne State University, where I went to school finally, uh, needed a bassoonist for a woodwind quintet. They were low on bassoons. So I was just this snotty nose, naive kid from the suburbs. And I went down there and played in the woodwind quintet the college woodwind quintet when I was a senior in high school. So I knew uh, that the, the parking meter was about to expire. So I, I ran out to put a nickel in the parking meter. When I came back, my Puchner bassoon, my school instrument had been lifted. It was gone. So I got thrown in jail as a senior. And then I had the uh, Puchner bassoon stolen. And so because of that, I got in trouble with the band director. I didn't get the John Philip Sousa award. There's a lesson in there. If your life doesn't start out perfectly, don't give up. You know, keep on going. You can fix things. That's a great lesson, Phil. Did y'all ever find the Puchner? The yes, yes, because it had the name 
stamped on it from the school. Whoever took it, we think it was an inside job. Somebody in the recording studio or something tried to pawn it and no pawn shop was gonna buy it with a school name on it. So not only did the high school get a replacement bassoon, they got the original one back. So they actually made out better. Yes. Could you share with us where you went to college and what the music programs were like for you? Yeah, sure. Well, I wanted to be a band director. So I wanted to go to Central Michigan uh, University in Mount Pleasant. And the, the, the band music department loved me. You know, they wanted me, they gave me a scholarship, but the, the admissions wouldn't admi ad admit me because the 2.3 average high school, everybody wanted to go to college because of the Vietnam War. So the colleges, you had to have pretty good grade point average. So they recommended a junior college. Well, my, my teacher, my first teacher, Lyle Lindsay, knew that they needed bassoons at Wayne State. And he talked to the band director and the band director talked to admissions. And I got in on probation at Wayne State, which is a, a school in the middle of Detroit. It's like a jewel in the middle of a desert, if you could say that. It's rough rough area around it. But Wayne State was really a good, good solid place right there. And so I went to Wayne State and I, I, I'd like to say that uh, I, I used their instrument, which was a, an old Heckle 8112. It was an old Heckle bassoon, no extra keys. Everything was basic on it. And I didn't own a bassoon until I was finished uh, from college. I always used school instruments because I didn't have any money. Lyle it helped me get into college. And then I'll also talk about Lyle later. He's, uh, he was the contrabassoon player in Detroit. He also took me down to the union and signed me up for the union, uh, which, was, which was really, really important because I got to play, start playing park band concerts to get paid. And later I, had, I needed money for, a bassoon, for my bassoon when I finally got it. And um, I got the, um, uh, the loan from the Detroit Musicians Credit Union. So that's how I was able to pay it. I didn't own a bassoon this, until I was finished with college. The summer of college, I drove a taxi cab and I, I, I made $900. So I had $900 deposit. And my, my later teacher, Charles Surratt, Charlie Sherrard, he helped me get a bassoon from the famous repairman in Philadelphia named Hans Menig. And it was ended up being really cheap. It was $1,900. This was 1972. Heckle bassoon, it's a 10617, the instrument I still play. So I, I put my money in and borrowed the rest of money from the credit union and paid it off, you know, over the, over the years. And uh, that's how that happened. But when I went to Wayne State, it worked out really well because I was in music education program, but I played first in, in the orchestra. My first year, I got to play a solo, a Mozart bassoon concerto with the orchestra, and I formed my own woodwind quintet. And, you know, I was, I was the best bassoonist already, you know, so it wasn't like you had to wait your turn there. And you got to study with people in the Detroit Symphony. So even though it's, it's, it's no Curtis Institute or Juilliard or any kind of, it's, not, it's a state school, but they had good faculty. And I had a good, a good chance there. Yeah. Could you tell us more about your teachers and how they influenced you? Sure, I'd like to do that. Uh, Lyle Lindsay was a contrabassoon player. He was my first teacher. And uh, he taught me a good solid foundation. Then he took a year off from teaching and, and I studied with uh, William Kaplan. Bill Kaplan was second bassoon in the Detroit Symphony. And he ended up moving to Chicago to be head of the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. He was, he was the head of the chairman of the music department. And he also taught the bassoon there. And he's my only teacher of the forum that are still alive. Yeah, he, he lives in Chicago and he, the best thing he did for me was he taught me uh, the foundation of vibrato and about music uh, expressive, expressive playing, playing with, you know, some expression. And he taught me read making. Those were some really, really valuable things. He also recommended a trial for the Meadowbrook School of Music, which James Levine, who just passed away, uh, he came there for a couple summers with all of his entourage from Cleveland. And uh, they had a youth a training orchestra there similar to Tanglewood. It was really good. So I got some really good experience playing under James Levine and all those good players, uh, you know, when I was a senior in summer of high school and then a couple other summers in college. Now, Charlie, I, I studied with Lyle my first year. And then I studied with Bill Kaplan for a year. And Bill Kaplan left the orchestra, went to Chicago. Then Lyle came back and taught me when I was a senior. 
he helped me get into college and I studied with Lyle two more years in college. I needed some something different. So I asked Lyle if I could study with the principal bassoon of the Detroit Symphony. His name Ch was Charlie Serrard. And Charlie said he would take me on as a student. So I studied with Charlie for the last two years. And Charlie was great because from him I learned the importance of he practiced every single day. He never went into a rehearsal where he wasn't prepared. He made reads like a fiend. He had bursitis in his shoulder from the gouging machine. He was he was just a really serious professional. Mm -hmm. And I, he was really, and he helped me get my bassoon. He knew Hans Menig in Philadelphia. And so he arranged for Hans to sell me a bassoon. And so to Charlie, I'm eternally grateful and all my teachers. And then finally, I, I moved to New York after after college for a year. And I studied with Elias Carmen, who was principal bassoon in the New York City Ballet. He was a great, a great uh, player and a great uh, a history of him and some funny stories. But uh, really my, my three guys in Detroit, Lon Lindsay, Bill Kaplan and Charlie Serrard, they all helped me in their own special ways. Are there any tips or advice or realizations that you could share with us that you learned about the music industry? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, when you get in an orchestra, no one ever asks your opinion about what are we going to play? Where are we going to tour? You know, who's going to solo with us? They don't, they don't, they're not interested in your opinion and you don't ever give it. And that's why I enjoyed doing my recitals. I did some recitals. I'll show you the stuff later on it when we see the bassoon filled stuff. And so because I could finally be in charge of something and I could make some artistic decisions, I got to decide what was going to be played and who I played music with, which was really fun. About what I know about the industry, I know is if you get in a great orchestra, it's a great life. If, if you don't get in a great orchestra, you really have to work hard to do other things to supplement your salary, if you love playing that much. That's that's what I know about it. And I'm thankful that I was able to make a living, good living doing that. Phil, did you ever think about changing careers at any point out of music? Well, I was in music education. And after I did my uh, practice teaching, my student teaching in the Detroit Public Schools, I decided I would not want to be a school music teacher anymore. So uh, maybe, maybe I would have been a floor, a floor sales, floor tile salesman. Could you tell us about your teaching career? Well, I started teaching the bassoon uh, when I was in college. I mean, I've always taught. And like some people only teach, you know, people that want to go into music as a career or college age kids. I always taught high school kids. I, I taught at Cleveland State for a few years, um, but mostly I taught younger players. And I've had some pretty good players, I really have. And, you know, I'm proud of those and, and the ones that I taught. My philosophy was, I don't wanna send anybody to the psychiatrist. I, I liked the bassoon. I was kind of self-motivated. I looked up to other people for examples, but I didn't need somebody to scream at me to tell me to do it. And I never had a teacher that screamed at me. So some of my teach, uh, students may have done better if I had been more strict with them, uh, and if they came in and prepared and say, okay, just pack up and leave. I can tell you haven't practiced. I figured just coming every week, you know, it's it's good for people to have a one-on-one -on -one with a with an adult. And even if they didn't practice, we got to go all, over other things that we did before. So I think I made a positive influence on some young people. And I think some of them still play the bassoon to this day. Could you share with us more about your chamber music career? Okay, well, when I was uh, in the uh, Detroit Symphony, I played in a trio with the second flutist, Shaul Ben Mir, and the second clarinist, Doug, Doug Cornelson. And um, we were called the Detroit Woodwind Chamber Players. And we played maybe six or seven concerts a year. And it was really fun, really enjoyed it. Good players, we, we got along real well. And then when I went to uh, Cleveland, uh, you know, I did some woodland quintet stuff. We used to do uh, concerts to donate to the orchestra when they were raising money on WCLV, the radio station, things like that. But we didn't have a, a full-time group going there. So I started doing recitals and I did uh, maybe uh, 12 recitals over the years. 
um, at the Cleveland uh, Cleveland Music School Settlement where I taught, and so I would I would plan those recitals. I worked so hard on them. I can't tell you, but you know it was every two or three years I would do a recital. So the first half would be me playing some chamber music pieces, and the second half would be all bassoon quartets. And our our little hall was really good acoustics there. And if you fit in 250 people, then they were in the hallways and everything. You had this really happening feeling going on in the hall there. It, was, it wasn't too big that, you know, that you couldn't fill it and feel like you got an overflow crowd there. And we had, we had so much fun with those, uh, those bassoon quartets. I really enjoyed those. Could you tell us more about your bassoon quartet and the group and and the members? Well, it was always it was almost always the uh, the section, you know, the other three players in the section. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the concerts was fun. It was uh, David McGill when he he played principal here for uh, in Cleveland for about eight years, eight or nine years, and it was a Halloween concert, so everybody dressed up, and he he dressed up like Dennis Rodman, but Michael Jordan and Dennis Rodman. Oh, we're on the Chicago Bulls, and and uh, that's when David was thinking about going to Chicago. So that was sort of a little sneaky little sample that even though he never told anybody he was seriously considering it, he was thinking about going to Chicago. Mm -hmm. So, in which he ended up doing. But a beautiful player, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, basically, when we when I would plan out the bassoon quartets, I wouldn't just put the principal bassoon on all principal parts. We kind of shifted around a little bit. Everybody would get to play a little, you know, maybe a principal with some seconds and some fourth. And the contra player would play mostly contra, but some other stuff. And yeah, we we had a lot of fun with that. So yeah. was that with John Clauser and Barry? Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With George Gosley and and Ron Phillips when I first came and. And, uh, and Stan Merritt, that was the section when I came in. And wow. when we see the bassoon stuff, I have a picture of them in the studio, I'll show you. And then and then uh, John or then uh, John came and Jonathan the same year, three years later, Barry came. McGill came in in 1988 uh, until 97. One of the fun pieces we did that uh, from a, a really uh, gory movie, Doolin Banjos, you know that song? Uh -huh. it's, it's a really gory movie from the South. Anyway, I had an arrangement made. That was so much fun. Is there a memorable audition experience that you could share with us? Well, yeah, I mean, my audition in Cleveland, I think is memorable because it was in April and I was in Detroit. I had been there quite a few years and, you know, I, I, Detroit was a really good orchestra, but Cleveland toured regularly. They recorded regularly. They had international prestige. And, you know, when I was in Detroit, people would ask me, oh, is that a full-time job? People never asked me in Cleveland, is that a full-time job? Mm. When I moved to Cleveland and started looking for housing, you mentioned the Cleveland Orchestra, immediate, immediate respect. The Cleveland Orchestra is really special. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, so I was in Detroit those years and I, think, I thought maybe, maybe I'd like to make it in a place where I hadn't studied with the section, <laughs> you know, and make it on my own somewhere else. So. I auditioned and got into uh, to Cleveland. And when I came up, it's right next to the Cleveland Museum of Art. And they, there's a reflecting pond in there, a little lake. And around that are all these beautiful trees. Well, this happened to be the time that all the dogwoods and, and uh, cherry blossoms and things there were all um, blooming. It was so beautiful, I can't tell you. And when I walked into um, to the, um, to the building, the doorman was so gracious his name is Willie, and he was so gracious and so nice. And when I auditioned, Alkowski was the uh, person that take you to the stage, takes you to the stage. Proctor, yeah, mm -hmm. he was a proctor. He was so nice. He said he gave me a hint. He says you don't have to overblow in this hall. You know, <laughs> I remember him saying that. So when I got out there, I was the fifth person to play that day. And, and at that time, Cleveland didn't didn't do uh, they didn't do finals and stuff. They heard everybody and then you went home. You played and you went home. You didn't even have your excerpts. They told you pieces of music, Chike Six, you know, you had to prepare the whole piece. So they actually dug out pieces in the middle, you know, with key changes and stuff that you wouldn't normally practice. So somebody with a little experience like me, nine years of experience, it, it was it worked out well for me. So that was that was my Cleveland experience, and uh, I remember David uh, David Zouder, the personnel manager, 
came up to the stage after I played and he says, we'll, we'll be in touch. So the next Monday I got a call and they offered me the job. But uh, anyway, so it was my day. That's the thing about auditions. Sometimes it's your day, sometimes it's not. If you've got a good read, I'm af if I have a good read, I'm afraid of nobody, Julie. No conductor scares <laughs> me. Otherwise I'm terrified. <laughs> How do you cope with music performance anxiety, if that is something that you've experienced before? Well, you know, some people take pills and things like that, um, but I never did. I didn't want to start with that. Everybody has anxiety. But I want to tell you something. Second's got a lot of challenges. Playing second has a lot of challenges. And, and you're always an underappreciated person, in my opinion, because you do so much with setting the tuning and staying with the bases and, you know, it's it's just helping the first player. It's a big job. And I want to tell you something, it's a bigger job playing principal. So if I had a principal job, I, I probably would have had much less time with my kids. I probably would have sweated out things a lot more. Maybe I would have had a psychiatrist. I don't know, but I, I managed to get through a career without taking any pills. And my thing on tour, and we'll talk about tour a little later and when I show my stuff, uh, is 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 uh, where everybody was out mountain climbing and doing different things. My my thing was I have to take a nap. If I got a concert that night, I have to take a nap. So just be rested, be prepared, have a good read. If I had a good read, I didn't worry too much. Could you share with us about your read making style and any techniques? Okay, well, I I think I kind of make a, a Cheryl Leonard Cheryl kind of read. My first shaper, Bill Kaplan got from a company in New York called Lynx and Long, and it was a, a copy of a Leonard Sherrill shape, slightly asymmetrical. And when I finally got it, that, uh, my, my college roommate used it as a screwdriver and chipped the end of it off. I finally got it copied. I sent it to Rieger, and I, I sent my old shaper, and they made me a new one. They also made it asymmetrical the same. So I have a full type shaper and I made like a Leonard Chero type read. I did take uh, read lessons with Lou Skinner and I spent a week in, uh, in West Jonesport, Maine with him. And at the end, he uh, took me out on a uh, lobster boat with his friend and I came home with some lobsters in the cooler. So that was a nice experience. But uh, so anyway, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, 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 to me, there are sort of three different sounds in the world. There was, there was the German sound, that was the one that John Miller had, and he was getting reads from, from Germans, I think, from mm. European people. The uh, Leonard Sherrill, the Bernard Garfields, Leonard Sherrill's a little darker than Bernard Garfield, but Bernard Garfield was my idol, and these are, I think it's the American, kind of the American sound. And then mm. some people play lighter reads and resemble more of a French kind of school. Mm -hmm. buzzier you want to use that uh, for for brighter so mm -hmm. I, I like to think that I have a sound somewhere in the middle so mm -hmm. I had all these different bassoon players to work with and it seemed to blend pretty well with all of them I mean nobody ever said Phil could you change your sound for me mm -hmm. so so but some people uh, Julie they they experiment their whole life mm -hmm. you know and I I I, had, I only had one bassoon. I had the same shape. I took lessons with Lou Skinner and I changed from inches to metric. And I made some changes, a few changes then mm -hmm. and incorporated it into how I made music, you know, how I made my reads. Uh, because when I first came back from Skinner, it didn't work. They were too, way too heavy and too dark. So, you know, um, I guess I make an American kind of read kind of a Leonard Sherrill shape. And I don't know what else to say, but I didn't really change it because, you know, 52 week contract, you get some nice vacation weeks, but I really didn't have time to screw around too much. You know, I just, I did what worked and I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. And I still do it the same way. What are important skills that you've learned through music that apply to everyday life? Well, yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing is, Julie, be on time, show up, be on time, be responsible, do your job. You know, if you do that, you're going to be a success at just about anything. Is there any advice that you could share for musicians just starting out their music careers? Well, yeah, I mean, if you if you want to if you want to go into it for profession, you have to understand that 
somebody who goes to school and becomes a CPA, they have a 95% chance of getting a job when they graduate. When you go to a music conservatory or you go to any good school that has a music performance program, when you graduate, you probably have 5% or less chance of getting a paying job when you're done. So number one, you got to want that so much. It's, it's got to, it's just, just, I'm willing to take that chance. Okay. And then having said that, then you have to be the best wherever you are or right next to being the best. Whatever group you belong to, whatever school, whatever orchestra, whatever you're in, you've, you've got to be right up there. You've got to, you, you can't fool yourself and think I'm going to, I'm going to make this just because I'm going to pay all this tuition to go to this expensive school. If you don't have it, what it takes, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's really tough. You got to, you got to practice hard. I recommend people go to summer music venues, Tanglewood, whatever you can get into, you know, Blue Water, uh, Interlochen, you know, whatever you can do, try to do something so you're doing it year round. If you can change uh, and, and get another teacher in the summer, it's always, I think it's always nice, as long as that teacher doesn't try to completely change you as a person. Is there anyone that you'd be interested to see interviewed next for this project? Well, you know, I have so many uh, American friends that I, I could recommend, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna recommend two people okay. uh, that, that I think would be interesting for your show. One is my Czech friend. His name is Jerzy Seidel. J-I-R-I Seidel, S-E-I-D-L. He was one of the principal bassoons of the Czech Philharmonic. Wow. And he's retired, like me. And he and his friend Pavla showed Emily and me around uh, the Czech Republic a few years ago. And they took us around <laughs> in the car. And it was, it was so, they took us to the place where they make the glass buttons, Jablinets up in the north. And it was such a nice trip. Uh, he's he's a good friend, and he has an interesting career because his career was was in a, a top notch European orchestra, and so he would he would probably have to have Pavla uh, help translate with him. I could arrange with you to his email address, and you can see if he's interested. And the other one is an American, and I uh, I was in the uh, Meadowbrook Orchestra with her, that James James Levine thing, and that's uh, Peggy Dudley, or Margaret or Peggy Dudley. And uh, she went to uh, University of Michigan, and then she moved to Europe. And she spent her whole career playing in Europe, mostly in the uh, Frankfurt Radio Orchestra. And now she's retired, and she lives in um, uh, she lives in Tucson, Arizona. And so, but I'd like to recommend uh, Peggy Dudley uh, mm -hmm. because she, she's she's a woman, she's black, and she's American, but she played in Europe. It's a really interesting career she had. So there, that's two names. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you for this opportunity to interview you. And it's wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. Well, Julie, I, I, I want to thank you because, you know, I'm retired now. This might be what shows up 40, 100 years from now. And I thank you. So, Phil, you've referred to yourself as a bassoon nerd. Would you be willing to show all your bassoon stuff with us now? I would love to do that. Emily, would you like to come over and say hi? Just stick your face in here. <laughs> hi, Emily. Ah, hi, That's Julie. Emily. Emily, hi, Julie. Emily and I have been married for 10 years. Emily's going to help me out here. What I'm going to show you first is an old bassoon fingering chart. Uh, that is on, you know, back in the day before 1850, paper had a lot of rag content. I don't, don't know if it was called vellum or what, but um, it, it lasts really, really good. Old paper lasts good. This is Daisy. She wants to walk on the old fingering chart. <laughs> it looks like it's got about uh, six or eight keys. And they say most, uh, most art bassoon had about six keys. By the time of Beethoven, <laughs> there were eight keys. So I'm sure, you know, it was in that ballpark. So this is uh, 1807, and oh, there's wow. a very small writing down here. This this has a lot of age spots on it. This has more age spots than my hands, actually. And on the bottom, there's very, very small writing, mm -hmm. and it says, published as the Actor X, February the 2nd, 1807, by Longman, Hurst, Reese, and O-R-M-E, Ormy, uh, Paternoster Row. So that's a British published bassoon fingering chart and it's from the time of Beethoven. Uh, Mozart was already dead 
but it's pretty cool. And a lot of the fingerings are very similar. And now I'm going to show you um, uh, the score Dead Elvis. If wow. you can see that. And um, this is a piece for Basu. It's the same uh, or orchestration as L'Histoire du Soldat, the soldier's tale. That's me on one of Elvis's motorcycles, by the way. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And um, so then they, th this is the score that everybody gets in the world who, who plays this piece. This is what the conductor conducts from. This is me on here. This is my 15 minutes of fame. So this is my performance at the Boston Music Center in 1996. And uh, I cut my beard and grew the sideburns out and rented an Elvis suit and learned the piece, played some high ease on one knee. These are my recitals and that I did at the Cleveland Music School Settlement. There were three, six, nine, ten. I did 11 of them. I did 12 of them. 1985, I can't find the program. But starting in 1983, uh, this one was called A Salute to the Bassoon. And it says uh, cheers and skull and prost and all that, different names, different ways to say cheers. And this says the bassoon in different languages, including Japanese. And that drawing, a lady at the settlement, Cleveland Musical Settlement, drew that based on this picture. This one featured the Phyllis McGinley song cycle. It's a piece that I, I like to, uh, this one right here. And uh, Phyllis McGinley song cycle by Alec Wilder. That's really a nice, pretty piece to play with her bassoon, harp, and soprano. Okay, and then here's bassoon cordials, and uh, that was 1992, I guess. Here's uh, uh, the Halloween concert I was telling you about where McGill dressed up like Dennis Rodman, and there's a contra bassoon sticking out here. My kids do these monsters. I have two children, Sam and Ben. One lives in Seattle, one lives in Tokyo, Japan trying to get as far away from me as they can. <laughs> and on that program, I did a, a piece with Mary Kay Fink, the piccolo player, called The Bear and the Nightingale by Umberto Bertoni, which is an awful lot of fun to play. And then this one is Bassoon Crazy Sing On. And that had, I did the uh, Sonata Opus 13 right here. Uh, the Ob <laughs> Sonata Opus 13 for bassoon and guitar by Carl Andreas Gepford. So this one's uh, Bassoon Crazies, Let's Get It On. And that's this one right here. <laughs> and um, Let's Get It On is what they say in the uh, octagon. My kids used to watch those wrestlers, you know, that fight in box and, and tackle each other and, you know, mm. kind of nasty stuff. But that's what the ref would say when they'd start, let's get it on. So that's <laughs> what this concert was called. And then they always called the bassoon a clown. So in 2002, this was the these are my figurines, by the way, in my cabinet. We'll sh wow. see those in a minute. And uh, send in the clowns. So that's that program. And then here's the bassoon from clown to crown. And you see he's got his, his crown on, sort of. He's a soldier. And that's in that one I did the Andante and Hungar Hungarian Rondo by Weber with a string trio reduction by Mordecai Rechtman which wow. I, I, I really recommend that. That's so much, it's such a good arrangement and so fun to do that. And then the last one that I did was Bassoons on Fire. And these are all my bassoons, which I'm gonna show you, that I laid out, I put plastic out in the garden and I, and I laid them down on all these bassoons and I piled them up like, a, like you'd make a fire in the fireplace. Yes. And Barry Steeze's daughter, Grace, nice. was, was into photography big time. <laughs> And she came over, so I, I built a fire in front of the bassoons, way in front and way behind it. And she laid on the ground and she took this picture of bassoons on fire. So it looks like these bassoons are, are burning. This is what uh, I wrote as, as my fun biography in that program. I said, divorced, single, white male, 51, bald, graying, pot-bellied, high-maintenance bassoonist, seeks ravishingly beautiful lady who possesses the following qualities. High intelligence, a good cook, non-smoker, fun-loving, warm, giving, caring, thrifty, loves animals and classical music, and who would be happy to sit home alone three to four nights a week and listen to said bassoonist curse bassoon reads the remaining nights. She can look forward to sharing an eventual retirement, traveling to visit other old worn-out bassoonists who spend endless hours discussing heckle bassoon serial numbers. 
Interested parties, please send photo, resume, and their approximate net worth to Philip Austin, box, you'd be nuts, Cleveland O. <laughs> These are what you can buy in a drugstore. And I don't know if you have European watchers, they can get max earplugs or not, but you can get them in any, any drugstore. This has um, a bunch of them in there. So you take one of those um, circles, which is silicone, and you cut it into four and you roll them into balls. So you've got, you use one for each ear. And when it's really, really loud, you mash them in, into the ear canal. When it's just kind of loud, then you can just kind of mash them down. And then when it's really, really soft, then you have to pull them out and put them in your lap. But these are not expensive. And this is what saved my hearing. I can still, I still have pretty decent hearing, thank God. So that's what I used. I'd like to recommend two book sites. One is called A, A Books, A-B-E Books or alibris.com. And you can buy used books there. You can find things that you can't find in a, in a bookstore, you know, a new bookstore. So this is a, a book that's kind of, it's got a little, a lot of us know about that. It's called How to, How to Run a Bassoon that's Factory. Kind of dark. How to Run a Bassoon Factory for Business and Pleasure. And that's by Mark Spade. And then there's a, he did another one that's a little more expanded. And those are hard to find. It's an, it's an English book. I'll lay it on there and you can okay. take a picture. And that's kind of fun to read and own that. It's like selling door, bassoons from door to door salesmen, sort of like. Wow. Of, uh, my, my friend Yerji Seidel, he and his uh, colleague uh, did a book about bassoon for and with music for and with bassoon from 1700 to 1900 from Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia. And this is his part of the country. He's from Moravia, which is part of the Czech Republic. And so this is all work that they did. And they show little, you know, a few measures of the music and, and the names of all these uh, pieces of music. Any bassoon nerd or any library or anybody that likes to play chamber music, you know, would like to have this book. And it's, it's called, I already told you the name of it. And it's uh, by Yerji Seidel. J I R I S E I D L and Franciszek Shervenka, uh, C E R V E N K A. So I recommend my friend's book. It's a lot of fun to have. Then children's books. This is the best children's book ever Ralph's Secret Weapon by Stephen Kellogg. It's out of print, but for a kid that's about six years old, you know, to read him that story, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful book. Real Secret Weapons, Stephen Kellogg. His, all of his books are good, by the way. And the drawings are so fun. It's really good. He tries playing the bassoon uh, and he uh, all he can do is make worms come out of snakes. There's a book that's, uh, What Do You Say, Dear? It's a book about manners. And it has, has been, everything has some bassoon in it in some way. So that's uh, uh, Cecil and Joslyn, S-E-S-Y-L-E, -S -E, Cecily Joslyn. Pictures by Marie Sendak, famous Marie Sendak. Here's one, I like the music. This is like uh, in Central Park, there's a bassoon in the cover. That's a fun one for kids. Here's one called The Philharmonic Gets Dressed. And it's really based on the New York Philharmonic. It's by Carla Kushkin. And uh, that's fun. It shows the musicians at home, uh, some of them putting their garters on and taking baths and taking subways. and what people do to get ready for a concert in an orchestra. Here's a very famous uh, children's author named Margaret Weiss Brown. It's called The Little Brass Band it's from the 40s. And it's really cute. A little band goes into the town, plays a concert, and then walks home. It's mm -hmm. called Meet the Orchestra. And it's written by Anne Hayes. Julie, these are my tour yeah. books from the Cleveland Orchestra. Wow. And what, what I have here is 136 weeks of touring I did when I was in the orchestra, which amounts to two years and 32 weeks, an average of four and a half uh, weeks of touring per year. And that's all that. And you know, it's really fun when you're young, but when you get older, it's still fun. <laughs> I just want to mention this group here for uh, people that are thinking of a group uh, like the New World Symphony. It's the Japanese version of it. And it's called the Hyogo Pack Orchestra. And you can play there up to, I think, up to age 35. And you can play in there for up to three years. If you don't get a job after three years, you have to leave.
but they will, they will pay for your housing and your food. They gave you a salary. And uh, if you want to come home and take an audition, they'll pay the airfare. So for somebody who's auditioning, go online and check out the Hyogo Pack Orchestra. And these are our, our cards and cartoons. And I'll just kind of like turn the pages a little bit here. Piece of music, everybody who plays bassoon quartets knows the pigs. <laughs> and then there's another guy with his, uh, his bassoonist and he's, he's getting his read out and there's his beer, of course. Here's two pictures in the Heckle Factory. Um, another Degas picture, not the famous one, with you can see the bassoon belts uh, right there. Here's the bassoon, uh, how, they, how they do it in the military, how they hold the bassoon for military there. And then here's an angel, that's a card. And here's another funny bassoon, tall, skinny bassoon picture. There's a heckle Christmas card that shows the angels oh, wow. and the border here. And there's one playing a contra bassoon. There's a bassoon and an oboe. <clears throat> In 1900, Heckle made all the band instruments, including brass. Wow. Um, here's uh, just a big group. Here's uh, Santa and uh, Rudolph's is playing the bassoon there. There's a picture here of a funny bassoon. And there's a, a song from the 60s called Winchester Cathedral. Anyway, this is the sheet music, and they're holding a bassoon <laughs> on their shoulders. And then here's a bunch of cartoons, and here's a frog playing the bassoon, and another frog. And here's a sleigh ride with bassoons, and Far Side, a cartoon, and uh, British. Uh, <laughs> these are that you would use for building trades. Uh -huh. And this one tube is, looks like a bassoon it and does. this looks like, a, they look like instruments, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, this is a letter from Henry Mancini when he had cancer saying he would be back. Uh -huh. And here's Beetle Bailey talking about the bassoon cartoons. I clipped out of the paper. And some more, this is uh, Funky Winker Bean. Okay, uh -huh. about the bassoon. There's uh, Lenny Handel, second bassoon of the New York Philharmonic, uh, and Paul Ganson and me. And oh. there's Lyle Lindsay, Lenny Handel, me and Paul Ganson. There's there. mm -hmm. some guys dressed up in Chicago. Uh, Lutrec, Toulouse Lutrec picture. Uh, members of the uh, Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra were at my house. And here's when we did in the Detroit Symphony Bassoon Quartet. We were making fun of our Brahms festival we did. So we had all hell had Brahms beards on. Amazing. And here's uh, <laughs> Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra and a British card there. Suntory, this is Japanese little figurines. Principal players of the Cleveland Orchestra over the years. Wow. Okay, it goes on. And, you know, I think probably, anyway, I had some fun with uh, with Saul Schoenbach. He, here's Carnegie Hall, the pro program that year featured a bassoon. There used to be a group called the Bowler Bassoon Band. They were really good. They have, a, a, if they, if you could ever get that uh, cassette or CD, that'd be fun to have. Saul Schoenbach gave me a bunch of stuff. Now let's try it without the bassoon. Yeah. <laughs> There's a smoking gun. He has a smoking gun right there. Can I just show you into the room here now? And yeah, okay. Well, this is the one wall. And my neighbor had this sign made up in the fall. <laughs> Phil Austin, put, president, make the, make the bassoon pull again. Yeah, and he actually had it in his yard and everybody was having fun with it. My son got me this uh, poster here. Phil Austin and Roller Maidens from Outer Space. Getting a glare on there, but look at the guy's hairy chest, it's crazy. <laughs> and then uh, I used to do a concert in the uh, Chamber Hall at Servants Hall. Wow. I was still the hobo bassoon player. So I would have uh, my bassoon in a garbage can, and then I would take it out piece by piece. Wow. And play it, and the kids, that's for kids four to six. Here's the uh, Detroit Symphony bassoon section. 
before I got in it. Let's see if I can get it without much clear. There's Charlie Serrard, Bill Kaplan, and Lyle Lindsay. Wow. Three, three teachers from Detroit. And then this is a just a nice poster I found. This is uh, what they call the bassoon in the army, O2 Kilo. <laughs> and, the, and the gentleman in there that's in the military was the personnel manager of the, Phil of the Pittsburgh Symphony. And now he's uh, uh, working with the Philadelphia Orchestra, that gentleman. And here is uh, well, one of my first wood carvings I had made instead of a conductor. Here's some uh, cabinet full of uh, figurines. Bassoon picture, bassoon oboe picture. The Detroit Symphony after I got in it, I actually had here at one time. <laughs> and here's a Le, a Le Doux or a um, music French uh, music catalog had that picture in it. And then here is the Cleveland Orchestra bassoon section when I joined it. It's me on the left and George Gosley, Ron Phillips and Stan Merritt. And uh, then this is my retirement picture from the Cleveland Orchestra. Wow. Everybody signs it. And there's a close up of the orchestra. Yeah. I'm, I'm in that one. And then when I did the Dead Elvis thing, they, they made a thing in the Plain Dealer about it. And it says, second bassoonist gets first chance. <laughs> An Elvis role. That's the, that's the article about it. And the reason I got to do that uh, was because David McGill turned it down uh -huh. and the assistant principal turned it down, Ron Phillips. They didn't want to do it. So it fell to me and I said, I'll, I'll do it. Heck yeah. yeah. So this is... Here's a painting called Bassoon in a Saloon, and that's a really nice uh, picture. You know, you can just imagine a guy going in the bassoon. Yeah. And, you know, and he say, what do you got in the case there? Well, I'll show you. So he pulls the bassoon out and plays him a little tune. And these are, uh, these are Christmas cards from Heckle from over the years. And three of my figurines made the cover of the double read. Wow. Winter of 95. That's one of the ones. Top shelf. And here's a crazy Italian one. And then here's the soldier, uh, British soldier down on the bottom, volume 28, number two. But this is what I collected before I went into buttons. And <laughs> these are bassoon figurines. And if, I, if I had a free day on tour, this is what I would go look for. So yeah. on the top shelf here, I have really, really nice porcelain pieces of porcelain bassoons and some of them uh not mine of course mine were purchased in the 80s and 90s uh but um they're really fine quality that's cross swords that's a mycin mark so that's a really really fine piece there and every every feather it's all hand painted wow and those those sell for a lot of money so this top shelf is all porcelain and this grouping right here of these cute animals that's a a guy named Bartley in uh London and he made these he was a nanny as a professor as a profession but he did this for a side job wow. and these are really really cute little there's a frog and a pig and a hippo and a what is that that's I guess that's a frog this is a mouse mouse and a frog yeah and then in the next row down we have all of our soldiers here, including we have World War I. We have two Nazis. Uh, we have a French soldier here. The thing fell off, but it's supposed to be like late 18th century. And then this grouping in here, you see these ones right in here? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Well, this is a, a bell. <laughs> He's a bell. He's a monk. That one in the back is me. And these were all gifts from my friend Yerji Seidel. You know the one I told you about? Yeah. And then there's a marmot. And he had this made up. And this is because I'm the second <laughs> bassoonist. This is, this is the second bassoonist of the famous far, marmot band of Salzburg. Uh, seven keys by so-and-so and so-and-so. So. But anyway, he had that made. He and his girlfriend made that for me. <laughs> and then this bunny rabbit was made by the contra bassoon player in the Czech Philharmonic on August 21, 1968. And that's called Prague Spring. And that's when the Russian tanks came in and squashed the rebellion by the Czechs to try and kick them out of the country. 
And these are all beer bottle caps. This is made of all beer bottle caps. Wow. And the beer bottle caps say 10%. And if you know anything about beer, that's very yeah. strong beer. Yeah. <laughs> that's right up there next to wine. So these are all gifts from my friend Yuji Seidel. The next row down, there's a famous one that was also on the double read, but not my copy of it. That's American. Two Italian ones, they're crazy. This is Goofy. He was um, in a 1942 cartoon, Disney cartoon. Uh, and when he played that weird instrument, they played the bassoon on the soundtrack. And then we have all kinds of weird animals, and I guess it's a dolphin. And then on the bottom, we have some. Uh, we have the British one the, that's made the cover of the Double Read magazine. And then we have some uh, ceramic ones that are anatomically correct, if you lift them up. <laughs> first one I had made, first one that I had made is a uh, penguin, because we kind of look like penguins in our tails. Yeah. So anyway, th this is, I got tired of collecting these when I got into buttons, then I didn't look for figurines anymore. So someday, some, some, some geek like me is going to want to own my collection. They're going to say, hey, Phil, how would you like to sell me your figurine collection? I'll say, well, my boys don't want it, so sure, I'll sell it to you. The, the mice and ones, most of them I bought at a store in London called Zelli, Z-E-L-L-I. And I could, get, I could get German porcelain. These are from East Germany. These are from Leipzig area uh -huh. and uh, Dresden. And um, I could get them cheaper in London than I could in Germany. Wow. It's really, it's really strange. So anyway, not, most of them were not commissions, but a few of them were. I have some bassoons to show. You want to see some old bassoons? I'd love to see your bassoons. All right. I well, like your bassoon lamp back there. Oh, yeah. Yes. Why don't you saw that? Yeah. Yeah. How special. And it works. It's on. <laughs> the other way, too. Yeah. There's a guy named Dave Brook. He was, uh, he's an amateur uh, bassoonist. And he used to live in a clean area, lives in North Carolina now. And I gave him the bassoon and the bass, and he made it for me and uh, Wonderful. put it together. Is yeah. that one of your reeds on it, too? Yeah, it is. But it's it's glued so much uh, that it's it's got so many coats of glue on it that you couldn't almost couldn't crack it. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to show you some old bassoons. I'll go with the old heckle here. <laughs> this is heckle. 3017 from 1870. And uh, the top here looks pretty traditional, but down here it's it's crazy looking. And there's a, du a Dutchman who wrote a book about called The Bassoon or The Forgot or something like that, uh, that shows this exact picture in here. This is so crazy looking. Yeah. Down here. The pancake key is so small and Things are so strange. And this, you can see here, it had been played in a marching band because it's got a place for the music yeah. stand. Yeah. So this this was a marching band bassoon, at least at one time. And then the keys over here, somebody had tried to articulate the G here. They screwed it up. But most of this is just the way it is in that book, in that uh, Dutch book. It's called the bassoon. No rings and anything like that. And the old bassoons didn't have rubber. They didn't have rubber in the... Uh, and the small side of the boot or the wing joint. They're just all wood. So. So what were they doing on the G that you said? Or were they? Oh, they were it's, uh, yeah. The, now they have an articulated G, which uh -huh. uh, the, the G would be flat if you didn't have that little thing when you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll show you on my bassoon. Okay. It's beautiful color too. And the. Yeah. Finish. See this thing right here? Yes. They don't have that key and they didn't have this ring around there. Jeez. So if you didn't have this key, back in the day, the, the high G was flat. Uh -huh. So this, this, this key staying open when you're playing G allows to open a hole here and you can get it up to pitch. Articulated G. Yeah, this is my bassoon. This is 1962. And this is the one I bought from Hans Menig. But Phil, in order to earn the money for the down payment of this bassoon, yeah, drove a he taxi. drove a cab in yeah. Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. This bassoon <laughs> here, believe it or not, I traded a heckle, heckle vocal for it. I should never have done that. It was a bad mm -hmm. trade. But this is a, a bassoon that looks, that's the way the heckle bassoons looked around 1900, 1910. They had this raised ledge here. See this thing here? 
Yeah. The old coolards have that too. And that's the way bassoons were built at that time. And this bassoon is called Heinrich Seltzer. And this is what kills me what it says next. Perfected heckle system. <laughs> I love it. Yes, they it is. Yes. The system. It's got the ivory ring and the whole thing like that. Wow. And that's just that's just like a 1910 collard. I mean, it's there's no whisper key and wow. still no articulated G. But there is a ring here now. I do have that ring for a C sharp trill, I guess. So cool. So why isn't there a whisper key, Phil? They just didn't have them. You know, the, the French came up with that first. I have a bassoon that I'll show you in a minute that has the French, has the whisper key up here. Let's see. Up here, ab above, wow. above the C key on that French bassoon. Uh, but yeah. Wonderful. Anyway, there's, let's see the keys on the other side here. See, there's no ring here. This goes this direction instead of this way. This uh -huh. key goes the other way. Wow. Okay, so that's the Heinrich Seltzer bassoon. This picture, if you can see, it has my bassoon. And this is Bob Elias, and he was the curator of musical instruments at the Henry Ford Museum of Detroit. And this is a Catlin bassoon that I'm holding. That wow. was made around 1810. Catlin made bassoons and bass clarinets in Philadelphia and Hartford, Connecticut. So we were building bassoons in the United States in 1810. Nobody knows that, but there they are. That's the bassoon. He, the Henry Ford Museum owns two of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. And here's a Dutch tile. I think it's wow. really, really cute. <laughs> and then here's a, a British t-shirt I cut up and put in this ring. The girl's playing the contra bassoon, wow. and he's he's uh, pumping the bellows, and he's <laughs> helping her with the air to blow the contra bassoon. Let's look at the uh, French bassoon. This is really really interesting. If you ever heard of the word rosewood, you hear about a bassoon being made of rosewood. Yes, this bassoon is made of rosewood. Can you see down here where the sun's on it? Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Now what this is? This is a um, this is a French bassoon, but if you look at it, it's a German key system. Okay. So look at all these keys down here. This is this is fairly standard. Uh-huh. Okay, you see that? Mm. That's fairly standard. And then here's our here's our whisper key up here, Em. Oh. Oh. Okay. Up here. Here's our whisper key. Wow. Okay. That's on the top. It's not down here. Uh-huh. Okay. And this is pretty much the same. So it's see the shape of the bell. That's a French bassoon made of rosewood, uh -huh. big old heavy vocal, uh, no articulated G yet. Has a ring here. Also has a whisper key here. <laughs> That's a riot. That kills wow. Me. That's I mean the modern bassoons have that now. Some some of them. And what this bassoon says on it is the letter J period, Grasse, G-R-A-S. It was made in Lille, France, L-I-L-L-E, France. And it says Brevete and some four letters after that. And it was, it also says on the, on the bell here, it says Fillmore Music House Agents, Cincinnati, Ohio. This was imported by, now, Cincinnati, Ohio is an old German town. So they wanted the German system bassoon because anybody that came there played German bassoons. But this was probably a good bassoon make, manufacturer. So they had a French company make a German bassoon. And by the way, Cincinnati, Ohio is union local number one. So the first union, musicians union in the United States of America. Here's the wow. oldest bassoon. And I want to tell you about, about neck straps and seat straps. Okay. My bassoon weighs between six and seven pounds. Okay. This bassoon weighs between two and three pounds. Wow. This weighs almost nothing. Yeah. So that's why it was nothing to hold the bassoon with a neck strap back in the day. I see. And, and now when, 
when, when you hold the bassoon, you have a lot of weight uh -huh. leaning on your first finger right here. And it's uh -huh. not good. It's, it's not a good thing. So anyway, <laughs> so this is a bassoon that is called F. Schadenberg, S-H-A-D-E-N-B-E-R-G. I think it's from 1840 to 1850. And it was made in Dresden, which we bombed in the Second World War. And um, it's, two, it's two and a half pounds. And my bassoon weighs six. And the modern bassoons now weigh about seven pounds, I'm sure. And so this weighs almost nothing. But you can see here, look at, look at how primitive this is. Uh -huh. Look at here, just a hole. Wow. Right there. Oh, right there. Yeah, right there. Oh. So, Phil, the weight is from keywork and then the wood, the type of wood? Yeah, it's probably your heavier wood, but it's keywork. It's more keywork than anything. Mm -hmm. Funny, this, look how far apart these left thumb yeah. keys are. Now we want them real close and with rollers in it. Some people have rollers and things. And the B flat keys on the old bassoons are always backwards. They're not, modern ones are open until closed. In the old days, they were closed and less open. Okay. Okay. And then here's a big old brass vocal, and it does have a tiny little hole board in it. Wow. This side has, as really, you know, the, the holes are boarded angles on, in bassoons anyway, so they can fit. This isn't too bad here. A little worse down here. The right hand's a little bigger stretch. Right. But you can see not too many keys on that bassoon. So I don't really know the age of it, but I'm sure anybody who knows old instruments knows the maker Schadenberg and they can probably tell me within 10 years when it was made. But I'm guessing this is a kind of bassoon, maybe that Weber, you know, the Weber bassoon concerto was played on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting so. looking at it, Phil, and some like parallels to the Baroque bassoon on the bottom half, but then yeah. how it's yes. changed its yes. bassoon on the upper part. Right, it doesn't have flapper keys. That's the difference. Yeah, but it's it's it looks uh, very, very sparse, shall we say? Mm. It's very light, very lightweight. And by the way, I got this bassoon for Hans Manig. Ha Everybody went to Hans Manig back in the day. I mean, mm -hmm. all the East Coast people and uh, Charlie Serrard would go twice a year and just have him kind of go over it. And he had a he he did every he had he did everything. He made all the screws by hand and. And if you wanted uh, spit uh, tubes in your thing, he would make them out of coin silver. And he knew where everything was, boxes. It was in the second floor place on Walnut Street in uh, 21st Walnut or something in Philadelphia. And so you'd go there at nine in the morning and he'd work on your bassoon until six o'clock. And he, maybe he'd charge you $120, something like that. Wow. And, oh, he was really something. And I was sitting there one day, the floor was wooden. I was sitting there one day in his studio and uh, he always liked you to sit next to him. And so um, I was sitting there next to him and he just, he just fell down. He had worn a hole oh. in, the, in the floor and the, the roller wheel just went right into the floor. So yeah. he got up, he says, he says, go get that box. It's, no, third box down. There was sheet metal in there. He just nailed some sheet metal on it, <laughs> went right, right back to work. Wow. But that was anybody that went to um, Hans Manning that was that was an experience you'll never never ever re replicate his his lathe was a hand pedaled lathe he didn't have any electric things you know uh -huh. and he had a bunsen burner going all the time and <laughs> he used shellac instead of modern glue for the pads and things he was he is something he is really something well that's that's four that's four and mine mine makes five uh, i have a few uh um colerts like three three color persons. Hey, would you like to see my backyard? Yes, please, Phil. Wow, it's so okay, beautiful. See. We have a screened in porch. We sit out here every afternoon. And after we get off this call, we'll go up. We're going to play Scrabble right there at that table. Beautiful. And I'm going to win today. She's going <laughs> to win today. And that's where we sit and have coffee and stuff. And that's where the shed is and the riding mower. Yeah. And behind the shed is uh, blueberry bushes. And here's where the garden will be once we pull the plastic off when it gets warmer yes. behind that that tree behind it is a is a uh, pear tree and we feed the birds and it's just really nice here and private and quiet julie this is um something i had made around 19 wow 73 this is like one of the first bassoon backpacks ever uh -huh. made 
Yeah, I had a Cuban guy make this for me. And I thought the treble clef was more artistic looking than the bass clef. Uh -huh. I'm sorry about that. But so I had this thing. I didn't use it hardly at all, but because I didn't ride my bike that much. But, you know, I was going to use it to ride the park band concerts and stuff. But it was really, I spent a lot of time designing it and the, the size. And I had a vocal bag made. Wow. My name on it and everything. So anyway, so. And now I just use a regular case. Everybody uses the shoulder cases and uh -huh. I just use the old fashioned cases. <laughs> Bill, how did you design it? Like the inside and, and figure out well, how to yeah. set it next to each other, you know, the part. Yeah, yeah. I just I just laid them out and then I made all these things with Velcro and, wow. and foam on the inside. So each piece wraps up. <laughs> wow. It's all made with Velcro and stuff. I, sp I was, I mean, you talk about being a nerd, you're, you're looking at the bassoon nerd right here. And so. all the fabric and the design and. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was something. I cleaned the, uh, the reed dust off a little bit. I have a clear spot in the front. It looks but Anyway, great. there's a, there's a jar of old reeds that are going to be in the center of a lamp I have in the garage. It's full of seashells at the moment. Uh -huh. So I'll, I'll dump the seashells out and put the bassoon reeds in. Wonderful. And then, so here's my here's my tools. There's a Pfeiffer single. Here's a, a unspitzable uh, tip machine. And here's my tip cutter here. And I always have, had TV on when I was making reads. Show Picture of a, us on, on tour one time. There's a pile. That's all bassoon quartets. And then in here, these are all second bassoon orchestra parts that I saved over the year. Wow. And then we get into duos, trios, quartets, quartets, and then, and here's bassoon quartets here too. Here. Yeah. Now this, this cabinet here came out of a 1925 junior high school in, in Madison Heights, Michigan. Uh -huh. And uh, it was a teacher closet. So it, it only, it was only, you only saw this much. So I had a student who went into word, woodworking for a living. So he made the sides and made it into a standing cabinet. Wow. So this is sort all the bassoon stuff. And this, back before radios and things, people had sheet music. So you, you'd have these things all filled with sheet music. Yeah. And this is where I stored all my cane. I still have a lot of cane. Yeah. Stuff in here. Fun. All right, here, here's a little tip that I think some people don't, don't think about. When you're, when you're making a reed and you're, you're forcing the forming mandrel into the reed, Mm. Okay, I'm gonna, I want you to, to look down here, this line from the tip all the way down to the butt. And I want you to see that right now it's not straight. This line, that is crooked. So I, I think when you, when you wrench it like that, the reed's not going to vibrate. So you, when you make your reed, you want to you, you look down the reed and you want to straighten it so that's straight. So it's not, it's not, bind, it's not binding. Right. Because that would stop the reed from vibrating. Okay. That's so there's that. Now, now the other tip is, can you see this wire? I see. Now, a lot of people, when they bend the wires, they don't stay flat. Have you ever noticed that, Julie? Right. They want to pop up. So yes. here's what you do. You push the wire over to the side, and then you move it to the middle with your thumb. Great. Okay. And I want to show you what that looks like from the side. Can you see that? Yes. And it stays flat. Oh, yeah, it's flat. You just push it to the side first Wonderful. and then move it to the middle with your thumb. Yeah. So there's a couple little pointers for somebody. And here's, here's my read. It's, um, like I say, it's a Leonard Sherrill shape. And I do not use a collar. Uh -huh. Some people do. I think, you know, if you imagine, if you, if you continued the collar halfway up, right. you wouldn't have very much... Uh, read to vibrate, would you? Right. So I'm thinking some people have wider collars than other. Maybe maybe a small collar, eighth of an inch, isn't going to hurt anything. Maybe the read even lasts a little longer. But mm -hmm. I never used the collar, and I and I still don't. So now I'm going to show you a couple of things on the bassoon. Here's the thing: <laughs> when you're in school, the teachers always tell you to sit up straight. Uh huh. And here's here's my thing about the bassoon. Yeah. I taught my students. And I tell this to anybody who will listen. And anything that I tell you, you can take it or leave it. It really doesn't matter. Just if, if, if you give it a fair shot, 
maybe it'll work for you. I don't like sitting up like this and playing with a straight back with your back out of the chair. And the reason is I want you to see what happens to the angle of the zoom. Right. Not standing this way. And now when I sit up straight, it's like this. So you have all this weight is being pushed right on here. Okay. Not only that, I'm sitting up straight. I'm tense. My back is tense. Everything is tense. Here's what I think. Sit back in the chair, even scoot your butt out a little bit from the bottom. Okay, try to get comfortable. And kids, don't try this at home. Keep your hands around it when you're trying it. But let the bassoon hold itself. Wow. See, now I can, I, I, I can play the bassoon. And, and, and I'm not holding the bassoon. The bassoon's holding itself. Wow. That's why I think the seat strap works so much better than the neck strap. Because the neck strap tilts the bassoon out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now I want to talk about, mm -hmm. so that's my thing, posture. Sit back in the chair, try it, relax. I mean, the whole thing is you're tense enough playing anyway. Why do you need uh -huh. to be tenser? So just try to relax, try to be loosey-goosey. And another thing is a lot of people like to play with their arm out. Can you see my, my right arm, Emily? They like to play like that. Uh -uh. Keep your arm down. Just let them fall, let, let them, like you relax. Just let uh -huh. them fall to the side. And your wrist is bent a little bit. It's not going to hurt anything. You can still move your fingers just fine. Okay. I, I, I don't mind a hand rest. It doesn't bother, bother me at all. But you need something. If you don't have a hand rest, then you should have the thumb guard that goes over the pancake key. You should have that moved over here. Or a heckle contra bassoon um, key. You know, you can buy a contra bassoon piece to go over there, okay. over the C, the C sharp trill key. And so you can have something for this. You need... A hinge for this finger, just like this is the hinge for that finger. Right. Okay. So that's your two things. So you relax. You try to sit back in the chair. You relax. You're nervous enough as it is. Yeah. Why make it harder? I'd like to talk to you about vibrato just for a yeah. second. Bill Kaplan taught me about, about vibrato. He taught me how to make it. And and here's how I teach and how I believe you can make a vibrato. You, you play a long tone, a really, really loud long tone, say on an open F. Uh -huh. And really, really steady and with a metronome, and, and you keep it really, really constant. You do that for quite a while. You use up your whole breath doing that. And then take your metronome and move it to the next, next higher number. And you keep doing that. You keep moving it faster and faster and faster. And you make the waves as wide as you can. Okay, so I'm going to show you a, a condensation of three months of practicing what I'm showing you where it gets faster and faster and then the waves get a little bit less uh, wide, a little less wavy if, if you, if, you know, if you will. So here we go. Then you go a little faster. A little bit faster and then make the waves a little, little narrower. You're almost there. Now this is three months time. I'm, your stomach has to adapt to doing that thing mechanically like that. So uh, you can't do this in one day, uh, you know, you young people that are, are considering trying this. You stick with it for a few months and do it. Do it slow and really, really wild, a wild vibrato, real wide waves, and then tame it down and get it faster. Okay, having said that, I don't believe that you should use vibrato all the time like a violin would do and the way some flute players do and some oboists do. I think you should, I think you, you can catch people's ear, you can catch their imagination and their attention if you start the bassoon straight and add it during the bassoon as a note as it's going on. Mm -hmm. And then, so now I'm gonna leave vibrato and take it or leave it. And now we're gonna go to double tonguing. When I joined the Cleveland Orchestra, I could hardly double tongue at all. And people were telling me to say ticka, ticka, ticka and key, key, key and all this other kind of stuff. None of that worked for me. So this is what I came up with. And if it works for you, Good, but it's not going to happen overnight. It, it happens over a long period of time, but you have to stay at it every day. And if you if you know the word hut, H-U-T, it's like what a quarterback says when he wants the ball hiked to him. <laughs> hut, hut. Uh -huh. Say that, and that's that's what you do with the air. You blow air in, it's, and I don't care if you hear air squeezing around the sides of your mouth in this instance. It's fine, do that. Force as much air and be as hard as you can on the T, on the and your then your lips are your your teeth is closed on your tongue. I can feel a little bit of my tongue in there. And then you say, can you hear me say? So yes. basically, 
you say, you make the forced sound, which is going to be your, you know, it's taka 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 ka. The ka is going to be a forced first note, not a second note. So you're going to go. I'm I'm forcing the hut and the T. I don't even care if I hear it, but uh -huh. but basically they're they're both short staccato um, um, sounds. And then you you. Again, you do that with the metronome and you start going faster and faster. This doesn't happen overnight. This doesn't happen over a week. It doesn't happen over a month. It happens over months, probably. So then, then basically you get it going. And somewhere along the way, you get brave enough to reverse it. And you go. Okay. And then. You just keep doing that and keep getting it faster with the metronome. Stay with the metronome and be, be true to it. And then finally you can go, you know, you can get it where you can do a double tongue. And that's what works for me. It's just amazing seeing your beautiful collection. Thank you for sharing so many of your wonderful views and experience. And it's been an honor. So thank you for this this opportunity to to see your life's work. And and so mm -hmm. thank you, Phil. It's been a true pleasure. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for two events held every week on the Music Link. Every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, a new YouTube interview video launches, and every Sunday Central Standard Time is a live Zoom group discussion session that you can register for on the Music Link website. Feel free to reach out to Phil anytime at Austin Emily, A U S T I N E M I L Y 375 at yahoo.com. He would love to hear from you. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and subscribe to this channel for notifications of new videos, which really helps support the Music Link and the Let's Link project. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based online resource for people to share, learn, and connect. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see y'all in the next video.